Well, thank you so much for joining us, Krish. It's amazing that you came all the way up from Stanford and we appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in meat. I walked into a butcher shop when I was 13 years old. The guy offered me a job. Is that even legal? In it was absolutely <laughs> illegal. So I did seven years as a butcher from the age of 13 to about 20 years old. And so when I left butchering, found a roundabout route to get to archaeology, had no background in the subject. Obviously, for hundreds of thousands of years, humans have been eating meat. But it's only really recently that meat has become cultural. When did it go from just like chomp, chomp meat to like having it be something where we had rituals around it? And The underlying problem with our view of meat is that we've become so focused on the outcome of butchering the product meat, we've forgotten everything else to do with how you come to have meat. If I ask anybody in this audience, what's the first thing that defines us as human beings? You right. might have said art to me. The first art is from Blombos Caves, inscribed on ochre. And that's 80, 90,000 years old. The first fire we've got evidence for is about one and a half million years old. The first evidence we have of butchery is two and a half million years old. There's some evidence to suggest that long before we were humans, as anatomically humans, anatomically modern humans, we were doing things that were fairly clever with technology, making, f making tools out of stone and with butchering. And I think that's the thing that we've missed entirely is that we've decided to concentrate on the tool and not really think about the practice, not think about the social aspects of what it means for us to share meat. I've been in butcher shops and I've seen the like posters of like, here's what the different ways you can cut up a steak. If I ate a steak from two million years ago, would it look like one that I would eat now? I have to say yes and no. We're really wedded to the idea of cuts of meat portioned in specific ways that we recognize. These things can only really take place when we create animals that have distinctions between their muscle structures, that have variations in the amount of fat and so on. The basic principles of butchering, to dismember an animal, to dismember, process a carcass, so that we can share, that has to be a continuation. Now, um, different groups of people have either formal or informal rituals around what foods, what meat they eat, what meat they don't eat, how they butcher it. Where, where do you think that that begins to get started, or what's the first record that we have of that? People who are predominantly hunter-gatherers, modern hunter-gatherers who are entirely modern people, they just have different technologies, still show evidence for very distinct mechanisms for differentiating between what is eaten and what isn't. The Matu in um, Australia, the social context is so powerful, they don't want to hunt large animals because it's so, it becomes such a pain in the ass to separate out and give individual people components of meat. It's just much easier to have a small animal that's easy to share. So I'm curious about like, what happens in industrialization when suddenly we have mechanization? How does that, how are animals at the base of that? Industrial and mechanized, um, agricultural, farming, etc. So those two things become divided. If you take Britain as an example, during industrialization, the period before it, wool is the most significant commodity that the country has. And part of the reason for industrialization is to develop ways to mechanize the production and processing of wool. It's really glib of us to say, well, you know, these animals suddenly become nothing more to us than food. That's not the case at all. Industrialism, really, it's based on the way that we change our view of animals and our relationship with them. Can you talk a little bit about what the Romans brought in terms of butchery and butchering technology uh, to, you know, what we would now call the UK? The Roman influx pretty much changes all of that. Um, and you see a distinction in the types of animals that are brought. The animals themselves become bigger, and there's a suggestion that they're imported over from the continent. And that also led to changes in landscape because you've got to accommodate animals that need more feed. Predominantly cattle, um, the main improvements were in cattle, but also pig. And the tools themselves have to change. They modify because more animals are being processed, but they modify also because those animals themselves are bigger. Is that literally what that means? They just need bigger knives? The knives do become bigger, but that's not why they need larger knives. The knives become heavier. The animal's morphology absolutely dictates how the butchery is undertaken. You can't work through bone with, with flint tools. It's very hard to do. And we overcome that entirely with industrialization and mechanization. I've had this discussion with, with friends who claim to be vegetarians and yet they eat things that live in the ocean. Yep. Uh, so as somebody who studies meat, would you consider things that live in the ocean to be meat? Yes. <laughs> Clear cut. Birds, of fowl, of, of mammals, of fish, it's all considered flesh. What about bugs? More for bugs. I think bugs are a really good way forward. Get us to eat less meat. But I don't think you can constitute bugs as flesh. 
there's a number of reasons why people don't eat meat. And it's not just because they don't want to eat flesh. It's because maybe they don't want to take life. So if you don't want to eat meat, then eat bugs, no problem. Okay. But if you don't want to kill animals, then don't eat bugs. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the current craze for paleo dieting? And so much nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that evolution stopped. Evolution goes on all the time. We're adapting to the environment around us. We're adapting to our diet. And it's just not suited to the modern constitution. A number of years ago at home, I roped uh, a good friend of mine into cooking a turducken. The idea of like stuffing meats into other meats, is there any like historical antecedent for this? Is this an American aberration? No, it's not an American aberration. The medieval period, for example, one of the ways that you really expressed your wealth was through food. You're literally talking hundreds of sheep, large animals, small animals, really important that the way you presented the animal. There are a range of dishes that include animals being combined with other animals, maybe not quite in the same way as a tadakan. The tadakan is really the idea of more is more. <laughs> yeah. What is the most forbidden meat? I think pork is, a, is one animal in particular that's been ostracized in a range of world religions. Cattle, for example, are, it's not eaten for another important world religion point of view. It's often the case groups of people who don't eat pork live in places where people really depend on pork. Two friends, one who is Islamic, one who is Jewish, both of them have said to me, I don't eat pork at all. Of course I eat bacon. And, you know, that's, <laughs> wait, really? Absolutely. So it's, it's very hard to be strict about what you eat and what you don't eat. We've talked about tools that we use to kill animals, but we have not heard anything about the ethics of eating animals. This isn't a new concern. This is something animal rights issues have been exactly. a huge part um, of history. We had the commencement of the, the ideals of animal rights, starting really with the cruelty towards animals, initially in relation to blood sports. And Britain was the first, I think a few hundred years ago now, to initiate these rules against blood sports, against things like dog fighting and so on, and initiate bull baiting, that's when you set dogs on them. Slowly, slowly, we see a, a difference. People starting to accept that the animal shouldn't be treated in this way. Often bull baiting was done prior to the animal being butchered because it was considered that the animal's flesh would taste better if it had been baited. It's, it's incredibly cruel practice. It was part of normal production of animals for, for consumption. You have a situation where the general public gets so frustrated with seeing death in a very public way that we have the development of the abattoir system. The development of the abattoir systems that we saw in Europe, Britain, France, Germany, were adopted in the US and then became you know, something completely industrialized, completely mechanized. It resulted in infinitely more cruelty to the animals on a massively greater scale. All the laws that we have literally around the world today to protect animals is from that basic initial laws that they started in Britain against things like bull baiting, dog fighting and so on. Removing ourselves from any sort of relationship with, with the animal, uh, the knowledge of butchering, the knowledge of actually seeing how the animal was cut up, that's absolutely not the case today and we buy meat wrapped up in cellophane processed in a very specific way there's parts of the animal that are waste now that have never been considered waste in the past we have a, a, a completely different system i wanted to know a little bit more about uh what animals eat and how that impacts the meat um obviously cows weren't eating corn uh in their natural habitat and now they are can you talk a little bit about that the cattle are fantastic they've got this incredible system of digestion they can eat cardboard. Should they eat cardboard? <laughs> Constitutionally, they probably don't look very similar to what they did in the past, particularly when those animals were working, as opposed to just literally eating, putting on as much fat and meat as possible within a short space of time. It's a small thing to give them corn. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good thing for them. Well, you know how there's the thing in Greek sacrifice where you have to make the animal nod so that there's the appearance of consent before you slaughter it. Mm -hmm. You all have some anxiety about eating meat, whether you want to admit it or not. We all do. The, the closest I've ever been to being a vegetarian, seriously, was when I was a butcher. Talking about the consumption of meat in the Roman Empire, for example, apparently some, some fairly good suggestions that meat only became a provision to be eaten after sacrifice. Good or bad, we have to do something before we kill that animal because it's really hard to kill something unless you become completely inured to it. Every single culture, virtually, there is some ritual in place to ease that process. And for some cultures, that just went out completely. There is, there is no death. There is no consumption of meat because of the death that it creates.